Hello and welcome to Socialism, the weekly Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. With less than two weeks until polling day in the United Kingdom, both the Tories and Labour have now released their manifestos. Jeremy Corbyn's programme includes big steps forward for working class and young people in housing, pay, public services, workers' rights and the environment. Boris Johnson's programme includes next to nothing and even lies about the extent of that. There is widespread distrust in Johnson and the Tories. Does the truth matter in this election? I think it does, and I, I think it's very important. I think it's very important. So to counter the threat to capitalist profits and the encouragement for trade union struggle, both of which are in Corbyn's anti-austerity manifesto, the capitalist establishment has gone into overdrive with smear attacks. Wouldn't you like to take this opportunity tonight to apologise to the British Jewish community for what's happened? What I'll say to, is this. I am determined that our society will be safe for people of all faiths. I don't want anyone to be feeling insecure in our society. And our government will protect every community. So no apology. The, oh, oh. How can Corbyn and the wider workers' movement overcome the bosses' attempts to obscure the issues and demobilise support for pro-worker policies? And if the Tories do lie and bully their way back to power, is that really the end of the story? This episode of Socialism looks at crunch time in the winter election. How can Corbyn win? Big news! We've just launched our new manifesto. So I thought I'd take just 60 seconds to run through as many of the policies as I can. OK, 60 seconds starting now. 26 billion for our NHS, recruiting the doctors and nurses we need. A million new affordable homes to rent or buy with the biggest council house building programme in decades. We'll give you the final say on Brexit within six months. We'll end NHS privatisation, bring down waiting lists and put patients first. We'll scrap university tuition fees, kickstart a green industrial revolution to tackle the climate emergency and create hundreds of thousands of new green jobs of the future. We'll build a national care service with free personal care for over 65s, the fastest fibre optic broad broadband free for all, a sure start centre in every community. We'll protect the pension triple lock, protect the free bus pass, protect the winter fuel payment and protect the over 75 free TV licence. A real living wage of at least £10 per hour for all workers, boosting the pay of 7.5 million people, introduce a national education service, making world class education available throughout people's lives, more money for schools, reduce class sizes, and have public ownership of water, energy and royal mail. We'll double the spend on children's mental health and have a councillor in every school to take railways into public ownership. Okay. My time's up, but that's only 60 seconds worth. There's 104 pages in here. A fully costed plan to transform Britain after almost a decade of cuts and neglect under Tories and Lib Dems. Take a look and decide for yourself. Boris Johnson's Tories, bankrolled by billionaires or Labour on your side, offering real change for the many, not just the few. Hi, I'm Sarah Sachs Eldridge. I'm the national organiser of the Socialist Party. I'm here today with Peter Taff, who's the general secretary of the Socialist Party. Hey, Peter. Hi. So it's the general election in two weeks today. I've decided it's in the style of the moment to conduct today's interview like Andrew Neil. So I'll give you an average of three words. I'll interrupt. Ah. If you're starting to make an important point, I'll cut you off directly. But having said that, I know that you've been through the 1980s and all the battles and the cut and thrust then, so I might not get away with that. Yes. So instead, what I thought is I want to put to you some of the questions that Socialist Party members are encountering in the 25 city tour meetings that we've organised, in the stalls that we're doing, in the workplaces and in the trade unions and on the campuses. Is that OK? Yeah, that's that? fine. OK, Peter, so... The Socialist Party has been calling for a general election to get the Tories out basically since they scraped in, in 2017. But is that still possible in this election? Yes, I mean, the possibility of defeating the government has been inherent in the situation in Britain since the election of 2017. Mm. Because Theresa May's government was a government of crisis mm. 
and Boris Johnson is a government of crisis with knobs on. They don't even so want to him, speak. do they? <laughs> He's a dysfunctional individual for a dysfunctional system and a dysfunctional ruling class. Yeah. But nevertheless, in the time that's left in this general election, and remember, you have to remember, sir, that, that this is the dirtiest campaign mm. for many a year. In my experience, perhaps the dirtiest campaign, going back to my childhood of 1945, when Churchill accused the Labour Party of trying to set up a Gestapo just after the war. So some of the attacks that are made are childish in comparison to the past. Nevertheless, the desire of the people for change, of working people in particular, cut through all of that propaganda and ensured the majority of Labour government in 45, of Wilson coming to power in 1964, and so on. And therefore, in this general election, it's a dirty campaign, and it's a dirty campaign because of the fear of the ruling class of a Labour victory. And it's a conscious attempt on behalf of the ruling class to set a kind of benchmark for future campaigns in Britain, if they're going to go through this, that they're going to try and lie their way back to power through distortion, through the use of their stooges, like Andrew Neil in the mass media. And we have to be prepared, that's the labour movement and the working class, have to be prepared to answer point for point the arguments that they're putting forward. Jeremy Corbyn, who's been vilified from day one since he became the leader of the Labour Party, and not just by the government right, yeah. by Johnson, but unfortunately by people in his own right. side, supposed to be in his own side. And that has been on full display in the campaign that has taken place in the past couple of weeks and even in the last few days. The Tories launched their manifesto on a Sunday, not the norm. They haven't got a lot in it, have they? What they have is unravelling. So it seems kind of like instead of having a manifesto of their own, they're relying on, like you said, this dirty campaign, this biased interviews from the media to stop Corbyn talking about the demands that are in his yes. manifesto. Yeah. And why is that? What is the threat contained within Corbyn's manifesto? And also, I suppose... We can come on to maybe how could those attacks, how could those lies be answered? Yes. Well, the thing is, nothing of this is a surprise to us, mm. to socialists, to Marxists, the class enemy, because that's what they are. Mm. That's the ruling class, the clique, the kind of plutocrats that run this society and their governments, which is the ignorance of Boris Johnson and his entourage. The way that they've acted should not come as a surprise. They're only acting in character. Mm -hmm. They are defending their wealth. Like robbers who have a stolen watch in their arm, it burns into the flesh. They feel the guilt of being the super rich. And that power that they have, the political and the economic power and the riches that go with it, are under challenge mm -hmm. in this general election. No matter how confused it might appear, there is a challenge being made by a left leader in the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. Unfortunately, there is many people on his own side who are prepared to stab him in the back, particularly in the higher echelons of the Labour Party and the parliamentary Labour Party and so on, who are adding one blow for the two blows that are struck by the enemies of the Labour Party and of the working class. But this election can be won. If we concentrate on the issues that affect working people, particularly as the manifesto indicated, the central point of the manifesto is to reverse the 10 years at least, and much longer than that, mm. period of austerity in the savaging of the living standards of working people, of keeping working people, the poorest in particular, the disabled, the old and so in the mud mm. of capitalism. That's what this whole election from their point of view is about there's nothing in the Tory manifesto. It's an empty manifesto, perhaps the most empty manifesto in history. Mm. It promises less than nothing yeah. to working people, and therefore they hope to concentrate all their fire, as has been the case in the last couple of days, on Jeremy Corbyn, on the Labour Party, on the manifesto promises, many of which are very good. Mm. It has to be underpinned with a general change in society and of abolishing the power of capitalism and so on, but nevertheless, it represents a big step forward. And if it was implemented, it would change the lives of millions of working people. So everything must be done to obfuscate, mm -hmm. to hide, mm -hmm. to 
not allow working people to arrive at a judgment through their own minds and weighing up the arguments and so on, but having to get through this miasma of lies, disinformation and outright falsification of what Corbyn and of what the Labour movement stands for. I don't agree with everything. He's not going far enough. But nevertheless, it represents a giant step forward as far as the Labour movement is concerned. And we will be making sure to mobilise in and outside of the Labour movement. If we get a Corbyn government, that's not at all assured because behind this campaign is a determination to stop Corbyn by fair means and foul. And in the last couple of days, it's mostly been foul. There's not been a fair wind given to the arguments of Corbyn or to the Labour Party or to the working class. That's right, because instead of hearing about or getting a chance to discuss a 5% pay rise for the public sector or rent control or council homes, it's been anti-Semitism, hasn't yes, it? Yes, When they say about, instead of like taxing the big business and the super rich, it's about our married couples are going to lose out. That's all they want yes. to talk about. And instead of free education, and instead of getting into what nationalisation would mean, they want to say, oh pension schemes are going to lose out it's going to be yeah. the ordinary person that loses out and how would we deal with all of that well we have dealt with that in our marvelous paper the socialist and the articles that are written in the socialist you will find a very clear explanation of what is happening at the present time but we're a small voice mm. when we've been given the opportunity of reaching the working class in mass audiences and we did in the past and we will again in the future for instance, in Liverpool in the Titanic struggle there, mm. we had more than what Jeremy Corbyn has had to face with. Every dirty accusation of undemocratic, of wanting a bloody revolution, of deciding to change society from top to bottom, and we don't dispute that we want to change, mm. but in a chaotic way of anarchy and so on. All of that cut no ice because of the programme we put forward which corresponded to the demands of working people then, of fighting every cut in the living standards of the working class of Liverpool, of carrying through on the council an anti-austerity programme of actually building houses, of building sports centres and so on. We did the same thing in the poll tax when we defeated, remember, somebody who makes Boris Johnson look like a podgy schoolboy in short trousers. Thatcher was the Iron Lady of world capitalism. She defeated Galtieri. In the Falklands, she defeated the miners in the epic strike, mostly because the leaders of the trade unions let them down. She defeated everybody. She was defeated in Liverpool, in the streets, and in the discussions and the battles in Liverpool, and was forced to give concessions to Liverpool. And the only reason why Liverpool then was forced to retreat was because they were isolated, because others like David Blunkett, Ken Livingstone, and others who agreed to support the struggle stepped back. Well, here we have now the Labour movement relatively united with the forces that count. That is an active and fighting rank and file of working people who are joined in the movement who are fighting for this programme. And therefore, if they're given the right message, it will cut through all the lies mm -hmm. and the disinformation and result in a powerful victory in the event of the general election in a fortnight's time. These are decisive days. When history can be changed by what the Labour movement, by what Corbyn, by what the leadership of the Labour movement do in answering these lies and putting forward, more importantly, putting forward a clear, positive programme of the way forward. And I suppose a question that other people have been raising is, and it's actually raised, I think, in the Financial Times this week, if Corbyn doesn't win, doesn't that prove it was a mistake to adopt this radical programme. That's what people are going to ask, isn't yeah. it? I think we'd say there were mistakes made, but of a different character to that. Yes, and the thing is, we're not given a complete carte blanche to Jeremy Corbyn. We agree with a lot of what he said mm. and what he proposed. But the problem is, the roots of the problem that we face today goes back mm. into the recent history of the Labour movement. For instance, when he was elected, we welcomed his election, and we said it was half a revolution because the right was still within the Labour Party. The Labour Party was two parties in one. We had disagreements with Momentum, yeah. who came to discuss with us. We said we'd like to be part of this change programme for the Labour Party. They said, OK, we can consider that 
if you wind up your organisation, you wind up your paper and so on. We said no deal. The labour movement is a federation of different trends and tendencies, unfortunately including the right, who they were prepared to still tolerate in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And we said they are a danger to Corbyn leadership of the Labour Party. The Labour Party was two parties in one. Mm -hmm. And that so long as they remained, and we had many arguments with people on the left on this. We had arguments with Tony Benn. Mm -hmm. We had arguments in his house when we discussed with him during the Labour movement meetings that we had in the past. And we said it will come back to haunt the leadership of the Labour Party. They will put the knife into the back of Corbyn. They had a backstabbing tendency. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible that they're doing it during this general election. Mm -hmm. Corbyn says one thing. And the right line up to go on television and the radio and say the opposite. But they would count for nothing if the proposals in the manifesto were explained in terms that working people understood and it would break through the kind of court and sanitaire. And the Labour councils could have played a role in that. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. The, the Labour councils, if they would have acted like Liverpool, a quarter yeah. of what Liverpool did, of refusing to carry through the cuts then they would have built up a bank of support now, a local level, matched by the support in the trade unions and so on. But that would have to be on a clear programme. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn has made some mistakes in the way he's formulated the issues. But first of all, the programme represents a step forward. Mm -hmm. The proposals to end austerity, mm -hmm. which has been the blight on British society and on the working class for over 10 years, the fact that that was the centrepiece of the campaign, that are tremendous proposals in terms of housing, mm -hmm. for new social housing, to tackle the problem of rents, mm -hmm. which is enormously beneficial to working people, the proposal to cancel tuition fees, that had an electrifying effect on the election of 2017 when mm -hmm. thousands, millions of students came over to the side of Labour, registered and so on. And there's a huge number of young people who are registering at the present time. But that has to be matched by also what is the numbers of those people who are apathetic, so-called apathetic, who abstained in the last election, didn't vote. You have to put forward a programme for them as well that is radical, that offers a fundamental change in society and will rouse them off their knees to fight and campaign alongside of us for a Corbyn government and for the situation in the aftermath. Now, the big question today, this precise moment, will the campaign of the Tories and the ruling class, will it be sufficient to shipwreck the positive message up to now that Corbyn has been able to give by this avalanche of lies, particularly by somebody like Andrew Neil? Yeah. It was scandalous, it was. actually, the way that that interview was conducted. It was conducted in a completely biased way, where Neil had his own agenda. And remember, this is not some kind of neutral figure on television. This is a man employed as the editor of the Sunday Times by none other than Rupert Murdoch, who showed his hatred of the trade union and labour movement in the attempted counter-revolution against the rights and conditions of print workers in the Battle of Wapping. Employed by Murdoch at Wapping to do what? To act as a scab, a scab in charge, to crush the printers and to crush the workers in general and to establish a new benchmark for the employment on lower wages and so on. So he's got a record of acting as a hitman for the ruling class. It was in the pockets of Rupert Murdoch, identified with everything that is hostile to the interests of working people. And this is the man who acts as the interviewer and adjudicator, and the only theme he can develop on is on the question of the persecution, allegedly, of Jewish people in the labour movement itself. I would answer him very simply, by the way, when he accuses us indirectly of anti-Semitism. How can it that Marxism had called Marx as their theoretical inspirer? He was a Jew. Mm -hmm. Leon Trotsky was a Jew. Mm -hmm. Some of the most marvellous ideas, liberating socialist ideas, came from the Jewish population, from the working class Jews. as a class society in all religions and so on. I come from a Catholic background influenced by Ireland and so on. I've broken with that now. But I would defend the right of everybody to choose a religion of their own. It's just not true. It's one of the greatest lies in history, this idea that the Labour Party is riddled with anti-Semitism 
and the person who made it, by the way, the chief rabbi, I have no hesitation in attacking him as doing the job of the Tories. This is the man who, when Boris Johnson was elected, welcomed him. Exactly. This was the man. He talks about mendacity, which is telling lies, a polite way of telling lies. He talks about Jeremy Corbyn telling lies in relation to the situation in the Labour Party. In my opinion, Jeremy Corbyn hasn't been forceful enough in refuting and saying it's just a pack of lies mm -hmm. and giving the examples and so on. It's about 0.1% of the membership of the Labour Party that has been accused of anti-Semitism and a lot of them, their cases are pending or they've refuted these allegations and so on. It's a contrived campaign. And this chief rabbi actually said last year, it was carried in the Iron newspaper today, in a letter from a Jewish person who said, well, this chief rabbi said anybody who attacks the state of Israel, who questions the state of Israel, which excludes the Palestinians and so on, carries through the persecution of Palestinians, that anybody who takes that position is anti-Semitic. Whereas in the past, the average person in Palestine or in Israel who has got an open mind would say, well, you have the right to have your point of view. We stand for a Jewish state, if the Jewish people want it, for a Palestinian state, but a socialist state exactly. in the context of a socialist confederation of both states and a socialist confederation of the Middle East. You can easily answer these charges if you get the opportunity. And in my opinion, Jeremy Corbyn was too defensive mm. in that interview. He should have answered back with the persecution of the print workers yeah. and other workers. What yeah. about the Hillsborough workers yeah. and the role that the Sun played and so on? What about his role in those? You've got no right to stand in judgment of Corbyn or of the Labour movement itself. The most important thing is in the manifesto, there are important aspects which represents a fundamental change or challenging. Mm. They don't go far enough as far as we're concerned. We would demand the taking over of the 100 monopolies to control 80 to 85 percent of the economy. It's not private enterprise. Mm. It's a plutocracy. Mm. It's a privileged elite at the top, a handful, not even 1 percent. Mm. It's 0 0.1 percent mm. who control the majority of the wealth in society. We should be concentrating on that and saying the idea of charging people more tax if they reach 80,000, it's a sideshow, frankly. That's not the main target of the labour movement. The main target is the big boys and girls, mm -hmm. the ones who are the billionaires. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are ruining society, who are leading all of us towards an abyss. Mm -hmm. And we say, take them over, carry through democratic nationalisation. Mm -hmm. There's already proposals in relation to the railways, in relation to other industries, it's a tremendous step forward in relation to the broadband, the broadband and so yeah. on, which could bring the cheap broadband. All of that's been pushed to the side mm. under this heap of lies mm. in relation to anti-Semitism. If we, if Corbyn, if the Labour movement could cut through these lies in the next fortnight, mm. then you could have a majority government, but it needs a robust approach. Mm. It needs the kind of tone that I've tried to set mm. in this interview. Mm. Not apologetic, not retreating under the blows of the class enemy, because that's what they are, but replying to them vigorously and going to the mass of the working people and convincing them of this position. The same in relation to the EU. I don't agree with Jeremy saying that we are neutral on the EU. The EU, I go back to 1975. He's basing his position on what he thinks was Harold Wilson's position in the referendum of 1975. We led the demonstration in 1975 against the EU. I spoke in Trafalgar Square in 1975 when we led a, a merry band of young people and trade unionists and so on of a couple of thousand. Well, our attitude was no to the capitalist EU, yes to a united socialist Europe. We don't have a narrow nationalist position. We stand for the socialist confederation of Europe. We oppose the EU because it's a neoliberal project. Its aim is to cheapen wages, to drive down wages, to drive down the cost of labour to the bosses, to drive down conditions, all of which have been documented. So you could quite easily say we're opposed to the neoliberal EU. We're not neutral in relation to that. Mm -hmm. We understand those people who are voting for Remain, mm -hmm. and on this I do agree with Jeremy Corbyn. We do agree with what he's saying because their fear, many of them maybe come from 
outside of Britain and fear being deported under the notorious immigration mm. police and authorities. We are with them with that. We give a guarantee mm. to everybody who's here with the right to stay. Mm. But at the same time, the emphasis has to be given to fighting the capitalist EU mm. and of the working people independently put in their own position. You can't be neutral mm. on issues that affect the lives of working people. You can say we can have an even-handed approach. And we agree with Jeremy in relation to that. I don't think, by the way, you talk about having another referendum. Mm. That means the votes of people in 2015 don't count. That's the way they will construe it. Mm. I think it's a red herring. It shouldn't be part of the conversation mm. that we're having with the working class of Britain in the course of this campaign. Absolutely. We've got to show, don't we, that it's going to be a government in the interests of workers and young people. And the manifesto does show that, but that's what's the difficulty that they're having getting it out there, and there are these complications. And I think because of all of this, because of these complications, because of the fact that the lies aren't being answered, they're carrying on, the Tory seem to be ahead in the polls, although obviously we can't trust any polls at this stage. It's too complicated a situation, isn't it? But I do think, well... Socialist Party members are encountering fear, fear that we're facing now a long winter of stable Tory government just carrying out all the attacks that they want to make on the working class and the youth and women and so on. Do you think that's what we're facing if Corbyn doesn't manage to cut through in the last two years? Definitely not. I mean, the election is a decisive moment. Yeah. Because if an election takes place and against what appears to be the odds at the moment... Jeremy Corbyn gets into power, or even if it's a minority uh, government, relying on the votes, let's say, of the SNP, and Corbyn has made a big mistake there, why couldn't he just say, well, it's up to the Scottish people to decide. It's the right of self-determination, and therefore they want another referendum, that's up to them, and we will live with that. In any case, we would say an independent capitalist Scotland is unviable. It would have to be part of a socialist confederation of these islands, including Northern Ireland and maybe Southern Ireland as well. That's up to the working people themselves. We can't decide for the Scottish people. We can't decide for the Irish Mm. people. We can suggest the way forward for the people of England, of Wales and so on at this stage, but they have the right also to decide the architecture, political architecture Mm. of their future. And therefore, the question of, you know, how things will work out in the future It is possible that Corbyn could win and a new period would open up. But behind all of these lies, and after all, Boris Johnson, if we're going to use the word mendacious, he must be the most mendacious candidate, certainly since 1945. Tory candidate, that is. And he lies as he breathes. Mm. He lies about everything. He's incapable. He's like a. And it's it's kind of turned into a a positive, charming future of an overgrown boy, Mm. is the kind of media image that has been put forward, but he's not. He's a mean, vicious representative of the ruling class. And working people will do the day that he's ever allowed to get his hands on the levers of power in Britain. But what will be the future of that government? Mm. Well, if they do win, against the odds, I would say, if they manage to creep back to power, it will be a government of crisis. It will be inherent instability. It will not mean tranquility or peace, he will not be able to carry through his programme without massive opposition. It's true, we've got more strikes in this election. Exactly. It's the norm, haven't we? We have, we have the post office workers, the lecturers and so on, and a multitude of little strikes. If you want to know what's going on in industry, read The Socialist. It's the only journal which is carrying the real pulse beat of the working class in its day-to-day activity in the factories and the workplaces and so on. So, The prospect of a Johnson government coming to power will be frightening for many working people. There will be a period of gloom and they will rue the day. People who vote for Johnson or vote for Tory candidates and they manage to creep back to power, they will rue the day. They won't have to wait a year because everything that's been said in this election about the future of the NHS, about it selling off to Trump and to America, to even more draconian attacks on working people, That will be the order of the day under a Johnson government. And therefore, there will be, to begin with, a kind of feeling of shock amongst the heavy battalions of the working class. But then the attitude will, first of all, develop very quickly, especially amongst young people. Their patience will run out very, very quickly. Their job opportunities, 
their living conditions, their housing, the social services and so on, it will be a nightmare mm. for millions of working people. But I don't think they will just accept it passively. Mm. The British working class has certain qualities. And one of the qualities is they're slow to anger. It takes time. It appears as though, like an old horse who's beaten, it never reacts. But then there comes a turning point. And when it turns, it's almost impossible to defeat it. We've seen that again and again. And that's going to happen in Britain. Either way, either result in an election. If Labour wins, it will be, unfortunately, a government of crisis because the right will act as agents of the pressure of the ruling class to scale down to act as a break on Corbyn. The trade unions will be pushing in the opposite direction for radical measures. That government could face the same kind of prospects of the minority government of 24 or of 1931. We can't say exactly in advance. Even if Corbyn wins and gets a majority government, because of the right wing that's still within there, waiting for their opportunity to put the knife into Corbyn and into his government. We will be there. We will be raising very forcefully the question of our re-positioning in the Labour Party itself. And we will get support from the ranks of the movement because of the support that we've given in this election and in previous elections, and right from the beginning in the election of Jeremy Corbyn and the re-election of Jeremy Corbyn. Compare what we've done, where we've stood firm, compared to those who've tried to stab Corbyn in the back Smith, Watson, the rest of them, and they still remain in the Labour Party. And Margaret Hodge re-elected. It's a scandal mm. that people like this are allowed to act within the House as firebugs and set the House afire, because that's what they are. We represent the genuine interests of working people, and we'll be restored into that situation in the position that will open up in the event of a general election and the aftermath. So you see the Labour Party... Well, it'll take a battle, won't it? But a battle to transform it. Yes, to... it will be a battle royal. It's not the first time we've been involved in such a battle. When we were no more than a handful of people, 40 people, we were fighting against the right wing in the Labour Party Young Socialists. We won a majority. We then won a majority in Liverpool. And the only way they could deal with us, that's the right, is by repression and organisational means. It wasn't for nothing that Tom Sawyer, who was a right winger, originally on the left, but swung over to the right, and that's unfortunately the well-worn story of what has happened to some of the so-called soft lefts in the Labour Party. But Tom Sawyer said at one National Executive Committee meeting, I defy anybody to go to Liverpool and defeat the militant by argument. Mm. The only way they could defeat us, they thought, was by repression. Mm. And even then, they only expelled me and four other members of the editorial board, five in total, and they thought that would be the end of the militants. And then that didn't work, so we then decided to expel more and expel the leaders of the militant struggle. That didn't work, mm -hmm. because we got greater victories even if that happened. You can't repress an idea. Mm -hmm. You can't lie against an idea whose time has come, mm -hmm. if it fits the needs of the situation and fits the needs of working people. And we're saying the working class needs its own political voice. So that means quite a transformation of just being a party on the telly that comes out in the yes. elections, doesn't it? It means yes. more... You can't win on the basis of a general election campaign alone. It has to be systematic, work day in and day out in order to build up a powerful force which then can reach working people in its millions and begin the process of transformation. And what a world situation we face, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. We face revolution. And that's what it is in Hong Kong, which can detonate throughout the multi-million Chinese population. They're not gone to sleep. They're watching by a thousand different channels of what's happening. Look at what's happening in Iraq, a byword for sectarian slaughter. They're rising to their feet against the sectarians on either side of the divide. The same thing in relation to Algeria. The same thing in relation to Chile. The whole of Latin America is in ferment and is looking for a way out. They're looking for, really, what Jeremy Corbyn has raised, and that is, he doesn't go this far, but what we think he should say for a socialist planned economy, a democratic socialist planned economy, that's knocking at the door of history everywhere in the world now. We're in a period, very quickly the situation has changed, where the pendulum has swung towards the left, and it will continue to do so. There will be pauses where the right will appear 
to be in control. But a new period is opening up. And particularly, the new generation will be looking for the kind of ideas that we're putting forward that can shape the future for them and for the populations of the world. And we do have to think about that, don't we? We can't just look to the 12th of December and then that's the end of it. That's only the start of the new... The battle goes on. If it's a Corbyn government, the battle goes on to force that government to carry through the radical measures it's promised. And that will mean a battle inside the Labour Party. If Corbyn is defeated and Johnson comes to power, it's against the government and it's not a verbal discussion. Then it will be decided in the factories, on the streets, in the universities and so on, with the new generation moving into action. They'll be joined by young workers. This is going to be an exciting period, irrespective of what the outcome of the general election is. And university workers, members of the university and college union, have been out on strike at 60 institutions all across the country in pursuit of their demands for fair pensions, for better pay, for reductions in workloads and ending pay inequality, among other issues including insecurity of employment. Here's Amy Cousins, a Socialist Party member in Yorkshire, speaking to a striker on the picket line. So I'm here with Anthony from Bradford University, who's at the UCU picket line. Anthony, can you just tell me what the main issues are that UCU are striking about and maybe some more particular issues to your institution? The strike is on two main issues. One is the attack on the pension scheme, which is an ongoing issue. And then there's a separate issue on pay and workload. And workload is fundamentally the biggest issue for me. Could you just explain a bit more about how your workload has changed? To be fair, this has been a really long-term thing. I think it's quite common in the sector that people work, uh, lecturers work way above their sort of standard contract hours, if you like. I look around my team and we all work sort of 50 hours plus, week in, week out. That isn't rewarded, that isn't recognised. It's necessary because we're chronically understaffed. The whole system is chronically understaffed and yet this is in the area of students paying the highest fees that they've ever paid before. I set up my programme, know exactly the ins and outs of the budget for my programme, know where the money goes, and I know that there's a big hole really in the finances that disappears to the university's central teams, and then it becomes quite obscured. Now the university is officially a charity, but they're quite canny at hiding where the money goes. So the constant argument back to us is, oh well there's not enough money for this, or there's not enough money for that. That's not how I see it, at least at a programme level, because, as I say, I set up my programme, I've budgeted my programme, I know exactly how much comes in, I know exactly how much goes on staff, and then the rest of it, which is, you know, a good 50% of the income, just sort of disappears. And I've challenged this on a number of occasions, and it's really difficult to sort of follow the money. So... The argument that there isn't enough money to staff us properly, to provide a decent service to our students, to give them the education and the research that they deserve, I think it's a spurious argument. I don't really think it follows at all. So for me, personally, workload is the biggest issue, but also you have to investigate, well, why is workload an issue? Well, at a basic level, because there are too few staff. And why are there too few staff? Well, because the employer consistently tells us that we can't have staff despite the fact that the fundamentals are there, i.e. I have enough students to pay for more staff, but I'm told that I can't have them. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers' International. This week we heard from Peter Taft speaking to Sarah Sachs Eldridge, as well as me, James Ivans. The audio clips were of Boris Johnson and Julie Etchingham from ITV, and Jeremy Corbyn and Andrew Neil from the BBC, as well as Jeremy Corbyn from the Labour Party. If you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for, we need you. Join our fight for a winning strategy in the Labour and Trade Union movement before and after the election. Join the Socialist Party now. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers' International by visiting socialistworld.net and help us spread the word by giving us a five-star review and subscribing so you don't miss out. Don't forget to recommend us to your co-workers and friends. We want you to send us recordings from picket lines and campaigns and reports of your activity. 
and we also want your questions, comments and ideas for future episodes. Email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk Socialism the Podcast has no wealthy backers. We survive thanks to the financial support of ordinary working class and young people and we're proud of the political independence that gives us. If you like what you hear, help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity. <laughs>